Hey, I'm Cameron, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad that you are here and would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some of our upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. We got a Bible. Let's grab those together and I'll open them up to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number six is where we're going to pick up today. Nehemiah chapter number six. If you're a guest, I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here today at our gathering. Honored to have you here. Nehemiah chapter six. If you don't have a Bible, I want to encourage you to share with someone that's sitting by you, or you can take out your phone. You can download a Bible app or the River Church app. There's a Bible feature on there. I want to encourage you as much as I possibly can to be following along uh, with the Word of God, the Scripture, okay? Nehemiah chapter number 6. Picking up in verse 1, it says, Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and that there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. And we're just going to pause there because that's the setup. So up to this point, the people of God are building the walls of Jerusalem. They're restoring the walls. They're restoring the city, which was reflective of the glory of God. It was meant to be an act of worship, meant to be a way of exalting God's name. And so the city being destroyed would have been a, uh, a way of demeaning the name of God, demeaning the name of Jehovah God. And so Nehemiah has led the people. They have restored the walls, the doors, the gates are not quite set up yet. They've overcome some obstacles, some cultural obstacles. They have uh, overcome uh, some uh, issues. They've overcome some different things with enemies uh, and so forth. And so things are moving along. And, and we know this was a pretty... A quick pot project because it took them about 52 days. We know that from chapter 6, verse 15, 52 days to complete the walls. And so things are moving. They're, they are working hard. The people have embraced the vision of restoring Jerusalem. But the enemies have heard about it. And they're listed there in verse 1, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. They've heard that things are going well. They've tried to intimidate the people. They, they've tried to make empty threats to the people, and that hasn't dissuaded or stopped the work. And so they're going to try a new tactic. The enemy is going to have specific attacks against Nehemiah, the leader. What we see in Nehemiah chapter 6 is kind of the enemy's playbook. Now, if you played sports at all, if you were to go into an athletic contest knowing the plays that the other team is going to run, you would have an advantage. So if you knew the other team's plays, or if you sent someone to their stadiums to watch the signs that they were given, there would be an advantage to your team. You may even win the national championship. Just a, for instance, right? I don't know. But if you were to know the team's playbook, or if you were to know the schemes or the tactics that they were going to run, you would have an advantage to winning. And so what we see in Nehemiah chapter 6 is we're going to see three plays that the enemy is going to run against Nehemiah, and we're going to see three plays that the enemy runs against you, runs against me runs against us. So let's pick up in verse number two. They've heard what's going on. So the Bible says, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. Now, if anybody invites you to the plain of Ono, 
don't go, okay? I just, I just feel like that is really ominous. I got invited to this restaurant. It's called Oh No. Do you think I should go? No. Okay. So they send word, and they say, let's meet together. Let, let's meet together. And jump down to verse 4, because we want to see how persistent they are. And they sent to me four times in this way. And I answered them in the same manner. Jump back up to verse number two. Nehemiah realizes that this is a trap. And they intended, Nehemiah writes here kind of as a note, they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? They did this not once, not twice, not three times, but four times the enemy runs a play that we're just simply going to call, let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah, you're doing some work. Yeah, you're busy doing what God wants you to be doing. But hey, if you could come over to this little valley, we want to meet over there. We, we just feel like we need to talk about some things. Hold your spot in Nehemiah and go back to the beginning of the Bible. Genesis chapter number 3, and we're going to see the enemy, in this case, not Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, but we're going to see the very enemy of our souls run the same play. Let's talk. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 1 says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So prior to this, God has taken Adam and Eve, put them in the garden. These are not fictional people. These are not archetypes in, in, a, in a fictional sense. These are real people a man and woman, he takes them, puts them in a real garden, the Garden of Eden, and God says you can eat of all the trees you want, but don't eat of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, because in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. Don't eat of that tree, but you can eat of all these other trees. Well, go figure the one tree that they wanted to eat of was the one that they were told not to. Satan comes and just starts when on the surface seems to be a very innocent conversation. Now, just like the valley of oh no, if a snake slithers up to, you, up to you and starts talking, don't talk back. Like this is not a conversation to engage in. Get a machete, get an ax, get a 12 gauge if the snake is talking to you. And some of you are offended by that. If you've been having conversations with snakes, I'd like to meet with you afterwards, okay? Uh, but the snake comes up and begins to speak to Eve, and the conversation seems to start very innocent. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? It's kind of this leading question that Satan asks to Eve. Now, where's Adam? Adam is not off working in the garden. We know that Adam is standing right next to Eve. But here is play number one, let's talk. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. We'll get into play number two in a moment, but here's the first one, let's talk. The enemy of your soul like Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, loves to set a trap for you and say it's okay to have a conversation here. Likes to create a truce. Likes to create a compromise. What we need to realize is the name Satan literally means adversary. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter says, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion Here's his mission, seeking someone to devour. 
There's no truce with the enemy. Nehemiah realized that. And also what we see in Nehemiah chapter number six is Nehemiah says, I, I'm not only not going to make a truce with you, I don't have time for you because I'm busy doing what God has put in my heart to do. So the enemies play there. Let's go to back to Nehemiah chapter six. Play number one is let's talk. And Satan will be very persistent to you, to me, Satan will love to appear innocent and harmless, but he is a roaring lion seeking someone, and that someone is you. He is seeking to devour you. So Nehemiah four times responds, listen, I don't have time for this. Why should I stop doing what I'm supposed to be doing to come have a conversation with you? I know that you mean harm against me. We see at the end of verse two, they intended to do me harm. Satan intends to do you harm. Verse five, in the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter. So now it's not a closed communication. Now it's an open letter to the community. In it was written, here's the letter, it is reported among the nations and Geshem also says it, that you, Nehemiah, and the Jews intend to rebel. That is why you are building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. You have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem, there is a king in Judah. And now the king, Artaxerxes, the Persian king, now the king will hear of these reports so now come and let us take counsel together. So play number one is really simple. Hey, let's talk. Play number two is about lies and accusations. Nehemiah hadn't done that. Nehemiah hadn't said, hey, let's build the walls so we can rebel against Persian tyranny. He, he didn't say, let's rebuild the walls. And by the way, I'm a fantastic leader. You should make me king. Nehemiah didn't do that. Nehemiah didn't go to the prophets, the spiritual leaders, and say, hey, here's five bucks. Will you start telling people that God told you that I'm the king? None of that had happened, so all of this is a lie. Nehemiah knows that, verse 8. Then I sent to him and said, no such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. You are a liar. You're a liar. What you're saying isn't true. We see it in Nehemiah's circumstance. We see it, just to reflect back to Genesis chapter number three. The tactic, the play starts with let's talk and then it becomes, well, play number two, lies. Did God actually say that? Well, guess what? God's not telling you the truth. God's keeping something from you. And Satan lies to Eve. We see here in Nehemiah chapter 6, the enemy of God's people lies and makes false accusations. Jesus says it this way in John chapter number 8. You don't have to turn there, but you can just put it down in your notes. John chapter 8 and verse number 44, Jesus is having a conversation with the religious leaders and he says this of the devil. He said he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. He's a liar. Revelation 12.10 says he's an accuser, the accuser of the brethren. And he does so accusing God's people day and night before God. He's a liar. And the play that so often works to derail God's people from doing what we're supposed to be doing is listening to and believing the lies of the enemy, the false accusations. 
Sometimes Satan's lie is so clever, and it's interesting for me to think about it at this moment because I think some of you are even hearing the lie right now that Satan doesn't even exist. He's a figment of religious imagination. For some, it's, it's more personal, less theological. Sometimes the lie is Satan saying to you in the, the quiet of your heart and mind that you're unlovable, that you're unforgivable, that your circumstance and your mistake is unredeemable. That God has forgotten you. God has abandoned you. Maybe in the quietness of your heart and mind, Satan whispers, your marriage is unfixable. Or your kid is too far gone. You're a drunk and you'll always be a drunk. Because your dad was a drunk and his dad was a drunk. Satan whispers that little lie into our heart. You're a loser. You're from a family of losers. Just look around. And we hear those lies. And Satan plants those accusations into our hearts. Sometimes Satan whispers into our heart like Eve. God's keeping something from you. That because your wife or your husband doesn't treat you the way that he or she is supposed to, that someone else, God will give you kind of a free pass. Someone else can fulfill that need or that desire, that love that you so long for. And Satan whispers into your heart, it'll be okay. It won't be that big of a deal. How many men and women have raced to divorce believing the lie? It won't hurt your kids that bad. Or just one more time. Satan's a liar. Sometimes he lies. One of the most prolific lies that we hear, sadly being preached and taught in churches across America, is, hey, everyone gets to go to heaven. Everyone's a child of God. Everyone's good. And we say things to people that we intend to be kind but are deceptive, you're enough. Satan's lies from the quietness of in our own, in our own heads, in our own hearts. And then we hear Satan's lies spewed in churches, supposed churches across the country. Satan is the father of all lies. He was a murderer from the beginning. So how do we combat lies? Hold your spot in Nehemiah. Go into the New Testament. Let's go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 6.
verse 11. Now verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the plays, the tactics. The classic King James word is the word wiles. The wiles, the schemes, the tricks, the plays of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Because of that, verse 13, therefore, so in light of this spiritual reality, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So you have a Roman soldier being envisioned here and a shield that is able to guard the body of a soldier from being struck with flaming arrows or darts that are being shot at the soldier. What extinguishes that is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. Jump back to verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. The visual here is that the enemy is firing flaming darts at you. Flaming arrows to pierce. And some of those are in our mind and some of those are in our heart. Those lies that the enemy seeks to hurl our way. How do you defeat? How do you defuse those? How do you block those things? It is by the shield of faith. First Peter chapter 5 verse 8 says the, the enemy is a roaring lion. How do we combat him? First Peter 5 9, resist him firm in your faith. James 4 7, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. So how do we combat lies? We combat it with the truth. The truth. That's why every single week we open up the Word of God and we say, open up your Bibles. Because you and I need the truth of God's Word to combat the father of all lies. It's not just going to be enough to know that's a lie. We need to know what God's truth is. What does God say? And sometimes in my life I feel like such a, a, a loser so unworthy, so broken. A friend of mine texted me this morning not having any idea I was preaching this message and he sent me a text about believing the truth of what God says over the lies of the enemy. That in Christ, the gospel, Jesus at his baptism, the father says to him, you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased because of Jesus. Because my life is hidden in Christ the father says to me, Josh, you're my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. That's crazy to me. What does Satan say? You're, you, you're a sinner. You're wicked. You're broken. You're beyond repair. You're unlovable. You're unredeemable. That's never going to change. And God says, oh, you're mine. I love you. You're my beloved and cherished son. You're my beloved and cherished daughter. So how do we combat Satan's play number two? We combat lies with the truth. Please hear me. That is why you need to be regularly, daily in the scripture. You need that. You need the word of God. Otherwise, you are fighting the enemy with a very small shield of faith. Let's go back to Nehemiah 6. So the enemies try play number one. Hey, let's talk. Nehemiah realizes they mean him harm. Play number two, from verse five down to verse number nine, is okay, he won't come talk to us. Let's lie about him. 
And let's accuse him. Nehemiah knows the truth. Verse 8. No such things as you say have been done, for you are inventing them out of your own mind. Here was their intention, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. Here's another prayer from Nehemiah. But now, O God, strengthen my hands. So here's play number three. Now, when I went into the house of Shemaiah, the son of Delaiah, the son of Mehetabel, who was confined to his home, he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the door of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. They are coming to kill you by night. So let's go hide in the temple. You go hide in the temple, Nehemiah. You don't belong there in the temple, but you should go hide there so that you're safe. They're coming to kill you. Verse 11. But I said, should such a man as I run away? And what man such as I could go into the temple and live? I will not go in. So this prophet here says they're coming to kill you and they're coming to kill you at night. You need to run and you need to hide. Nehemiah says, man, what a terrible example it would be for the people if I, the leader, run and hide. But also, if I go run and hide in the temple, that means death from God because I've dishonored him. Verse 12, I understood and saw that God had not sent him, but he had pronounced the prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this purpose, he was hired. Jump down to the end of verse number 14. Here's a prayer that Nehemiah again prays to the Lord. Remember Sanballat, Tobiah, oh my God, according to these things that they did, and also the prophetess, Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets who wanted to make me afraid. So Satan seeks to steal, kill, destroy. He's a Roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So play number one seems very surface level, very easy, but it's a trap. Hey, let's talk. Number two, play number two is to whisper lies and accusations against you. But play number three, Satan loves to establish False prophets, false teachers, people who say, look like, and claim to speak God's truth, and they're liars, and they're dangerous. Hold your spot in Nehemiah. Go to the Gospel of Matthew, to the right, Matthew chapter number 6. First book of the New Testament. We're going to pick up. Matthew chapter number seven, excuse me. Later this fall, we'll look at this passage a little more closely. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So we see multiple devastating predators that Satan is compared to and his teachers are compared to. Says you'll recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down, thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them, false teachers, by their fruits, what they produce. Go a little further in the New Testament. Let's stop in Acts, Acts chapter number 20. Acts 
Acts chapter number 20. Verse number 29. Paul is meeting with a group of pastors and leaders from the church in Ephesus. They're meeting at a little kind of halfway point between where Paul was traveling and where they had come from, little port town of Miletus. Paul explains to them, this is the last time we're ever going to see each other on earth. So he gives them some pretty serious counsel. Verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. It's like Jesus describes them as wolves in sheep's clothing. Paul here says they are fierce wolves, predators. Verse 30, They'll come in from the outside and also from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Go to the right a little more. Go to first, excuse me, second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter number three. This is just a few scriptures from the New Testament dealing with false teachers, false prophets. Second Timothy 3, verse number 1. Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all as was that of those two men. Just across the page, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. But the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So play number three, Nehemiah chapter six, was to create false teachers. Nehemiah had to know the truth so he could refute the lies that were now being taught by supposedly qualified people. In that case, in Nehemiah 6, it was qualified, supposedly qualified men and women. The prophets, the prophetesses. There are two things that I think about for our church. I think about for you, the church. Number one, It horrifies me to think about the number of people sitting in this room who think they're on their way to heaven who are, in fact, on their way to hell. It it rattles my soul. Because you've believed a lie that you can be religious enough 
or good enough, or you can pray a magic prayer and live however you want to live, and one day you'll be able to pull out of your back pocket a certificate that says you get to go to heaven and you get to escape hell. That's not the gospel. That's not salvation. And some of you believe that lie right now. The other thing that makes my heart begin to beat faster and I would say a, a, a righteous rage begin to well up in my soul is the amount of false teachers that are constantly bombarding God's people. I go to the Christian bookstore occasionally and it's hard to find someone who's actually a true teacher of Jesus amongst the mountains of crap. I don't have TV at home. My wife and I were gone for the night on Friday, and so we were, we were up in the metropolis of uh, Oscoda. <laughs> and uh, just staying there, and so I, I was watching TV, you know, just... It just like, wow, it's, it's, wow, there's five million channels and I still can't find anything to watch. But occasionally I like to turn on, uh, this is terrible to say out loud, sometimes I like to turn on TBN because I like to see what idiot is on there. And at first I laugh because I'm like, oh, this is so ridiculous. And then I, realized, then I realized the millions of people that are being deceived. Deceived with a false gospel. The false gospel that I grew up being attacked with was this gospel that we now call the easy believism gospel. Pray this prayer, you're good. Live however you want to live, you're okay. When the Bible says, confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, and then you are saved. It's impossible to have Jesus as Savior without also having him as Lord. For many, you're being attacked with the false prophets of what we would call the prosperity gospel. Come to Jesus, and Jesus promises you health, wealth, and prosperity. That if you're sick, it's only just a, a matter of faith. That God wants everybody to be healthy. Matter of fact, God wants everything to be wealthy and everything to go smooth and great and awesome in your life. And that lie is destroying people. It's a false gospel. It's not in the Bible. It's deception. It's a lie. We're seeing the false gospel that everyone is a child of God. Everyone gets to go to heaven. Folks, I want you to hear this. Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, said there is a wide road that leads to destruction and there are many people on it. That road is so wide that there are atheists who reject God and there are self-righteous Baptists on the same road. On the wide road that leads to destruction. Jesus said many are on that wide road. And he says there's a narrow road. There's a narrow gate and there's a narrow road that leads to life eternal. And he says there are few that find it. Few, many. And yet we have false prophets standing in church buildings around this town and this county and this state and around the world on social media and on television and on radio who are proclaiming false gospels, false truths. And the, the, the sad reality is there are so many believers sitting in this room who couldn't distinguish fact from fiction. And the devil is running this play over and over and over and over again in your life to great destruction. How do you combat the lie, or how do you combat lies and accusations that the devil will hurl into your mind and into your heart? It is with the truth. 
And now we see play number three in more of a systemic way. We see false prophets, false churches who are saying everyone gets to go to heaven. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. That's the reality of the truth of the good news of Jesus. Let's go back to Nehemiah 6. Verse 13. Scripture says, for this purpose he was hired, this false prophet. Here's what he wanted to do. Nehemiah says, that I should be afraid and act in this way and sin and so they could give me a bad name in order to taunt me. They wanted to make me afraid because then when I was afraid then I would act in a sinful way. It would ruin my reputation and they would be able to taunt me and mock me. And we do some weird things when we're afraid or when we get anxious. Yesterday, my wife and I, we stopped by a garage sale. We were driving up Tawas and Oscoda, went to Alpena. First time I've been to Alpena in my life. Last time I've been to Alpena in my life. <laughs> Wasn't bad if you're from Alpena, God bless you. So I was, you know, up in Alpena. Now God's going to give us a location in Alpena and I'm going to end up driving up there all the time. That's what's going to happen. Oh, man. So I, we were up in Alpena and so we're hitting these little garage sales. Well, I pull in, they got a garage sale sign out and you know, so I, I pull in. There's clearly no garage sale. So I don't know if this is like a one-week-old garage sale sign or this is like a perpetual garage sale sign. They just decided to not open that day. I don't know. Well, I get a little social anxiety and that type of stuff. I don't like pulling into someone's driveway and not being welcome. That's weird to me. So I like, hey, hun, there's no garage sale. Get in the car. So I hop in the car. I put it into reverse. I'm going to back up. Jen is halfway in the car and the van is almost moving. He's like, hey, I'm not in the car. I'm, oh, sorry, hop in. Sorry, I got nervous right there. I just got a little anxious in the driveway. So fear had caused me to either, A, leave my wife at the non-garage sale garage sale, or to run her over. Uh, so, you know, fear, anxiety caused you to do some, some weird things, act in weird ways. The reason I tell you this story is so you get the correct version of the story and my wife can't tell you the false version of the story. <laughs> I love you. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. <laughs> Nehemiah says, verse 13, I was, the idea was to make me afraid. And so then if I was afraid that I would act in this way in sin and they could give me a bad name and taunt me. And the enemy seeks to make you afraid so that we'll sin, so then he can accuse us of even more. Remember when you did that? Remember when you didn't trust God? Remember that secret sin? Remember when you failed? Remember when you said you would never do that again, and you did it? The enemy loves to do that. But here's the good news. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 says, The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I want you to hear that with hope. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Adam and Eve gave in to that sin. They were deceived. They rebelled against God. And what does God come down and do? God comes down and he clothes them. And he says, listen, I'm going to tell you how this is going to happen and he looks at Satan and says, there's going to come from the woman one who you will bruise his heel. 
But the seed of the woman, he will crush your head. So for generation after generation after generation, there was this huge question mark of what did God mean by that? When is that promise going to be fulfilled? Well, when Jesus is paraded through the streets as a common criminal and he's bloody and he's beaten, he's taken to a Roman cross outside of town and he's nailed to the cross and the enemy puts a nail through his feet and bruises the heel of the seed of the woman. But what the enemy couldn't see is that on the cross of Calvary, God, through his mighty son, was crushing the head of the serpent. And that's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So yes, the enemy is going to come and he's going to say, hey, let's have a quick conversation. No biggie, no harm, no foul. And you can know that he seeks to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to devour you. And you can know, play number two, that he's going to lie. Then you can combat those lies and accusations by knowing the truth. And you're going to know there's going to be a systemic uh, attack. There is going to be this organized attack with false teachers and false prophets. But this is what you also can know. Jesus Christ has defeated the enemy. He has mortally wounded him. And we thank God for that. We thank God that everyone who is in Christ has the victory. That's what Jesus has given to us. He's not only forgiven us of all of our sins and guaranteed us eternal life But he has said, I have defeated the enemy. He's a defeated foe. Maybe you're here and you believe some of those lies. Those lies concerning the gospel. It's interesting that we could vacillate between two extremes. One extreme being, I'm good enough, I'm all set with God, I don't have anything that needs to be forgiven, to this over here that God can't forgive me. And neither are true. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's laws, we've all sinned against a holy God. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Not just a physical death, but eternal death, eternal separation from God in an awful, terrible place called hell. That's what Jesus said. But the Bible tells us some really good news, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever is you, whether you feel entitled to salvation or whether you feel like God could never save you, the Bible says if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. That's the good news of the gospel. Maybe you're sitting here right now in the still small voice of the Holy Spirit is speaking into your heart. And the Lord is saying, that's you. Maybe you've been part of the church for a long time. Maybe this is your first week, but the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. And you think, whoa. The Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Save from the eternal consequences of your sin. I'm going to ask you to do this across the room. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes. Just a very quiet moment between you and the Lord. Maybe you're here today. And you just need to hear the truth of what God says about you. Maybe you're here and you need to be born again today, saved. 
In a moment, I'm going to pray, and the band's going to come and lead us in a song. I'm going to get ready. We have a young lady being baptized today. Baptized, she's getting baptized not to be saved, but she's getting baptized to show on the outside what the Lord has done on the inside. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are repenting of your sins and believing in Jesus right now for the first time and you need to come and be baptized to show on the outside what God has done, the transformation that he has brought on the inside. I'm going to pray in just a moment. The band's going to sing and during that song, you can walk right through those curtains to my left, your right. There'll be some folks back there, they'd love to meet with you, talk with you for just a moment. They got shorts and t-shirts and towels. They'd love to help you be baptized today. Maybe that's you. Maybe you need to take that step of obedience today. Be a bold one. Maybe you're a dad and you've been too stubborn about that. And the Lord is breaking you today over that. If that's you, I'd love to help you get baptized today. Maybe you have a friend that's nervous. Come back with them. Doesn't mean you have to get baptized, but just to be there with them. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for today. I pray, God, you'd move in hearts. Save those who are lost, who are far from you, Lord. Those who are deceived, please shine the truth of the gospel in their hearts in this moment, Lord. In Jesus' name.